So, um, in the last class, we were talking about um, something pretty abstract about the behavior um, near the critical point. Um, in this class, I want to come back to something much more practical than that, about uh, how experiments are done to study the gas to liquid transition. Okay. And what I want to emphasize is that an experiment can be done at constant pressure or at constant volume. And you know, up till now, we've been mainly thinking about the constant pressure case, right? But the other is also possible. So um, here, I'll try to draw my little cartoon of an experiment, okay? So suppose we have a, a cylinder with some sample of gas, okay? And there's a piston on the top, okay? So this is a constant uh, pressure experiment. So in this experiment, there is some pressure P uh, pushing down on the piston on top of this cylinder, okay? And then inside the cylinder, there are N molecules of some gas or liquid. Right? And we can control the temperature uh, by, say, having a flame on the bottom. That's supposed to be a flame. Um, okay, and so, um, you know, in this experiment, we, we have a, a Bunsen burner under the cylinder to uh, fix the temperature Okay. And we fix the pressure, and then we can see what the material does. All right. So one thing that we can observe is what's the volume that the material chooses. Okay. So we will measure the volume, and also um, we might have a, a, a window. Uh, in this uh, cylinder, a little window, so that we can look inside and see what phase is in there. Okay. And so, um, if we have uh, a low temperature, perhaps it's a liquid. If we have a high temperature, it's a gas. Right? And um, we can tell the difference because at a certain temperature, the boiling temperature, right, the, the, the piston will go way up, right? So the piston will be down at low temperature. There'll just be a little volume of liquid on the bottom, or, you know, filling up this small volume, right? And then at the boiling point, piston gets pushed way up. And then the cylinder is full of gas. Um, but there's now also a, a different kind of experiment that we could do. All right, so that would be uh, a constant volume experiment. So suppose we have a, a cylinder with some fixed volume. Right. And so it, it has uh, a fixed volume, and this is some super strong titanium cylinder that cannot possibly change its volume, no matter how strongly the forces push in or out on it. Right. And again, there's some you know, flame underneath, so that we... Uh, fix the temperature, T, and again, we have um, N molecules uh, inside the cylinder. Okay. So, because we have specified how many molecules and what's the volume, um, that means that we have um, necessarily 
uh, fixed the, um, the little v, the volume per molecule, right? So cert, there's a specific capital V and a specific N, then necessarily there's a fixed ratio of those things, right? And um, now, uh, one thing we could do is to um, measure the pressure. So perhaps there's a little port on the side and we can put in a, you know, a tire pressure gauge, something like that, um, and, um, and see uh, what is the pressure inside the cylinder. And uh, in addition to measuring the pressure, uh, we can also uh, look in the window and see what's inside of the cylinder. Okay. So this is a similar experiment um, to the previous one, but it's not exactly the same, right? So in, in you know, experiment number one uh, over here, it's constant pressure and temperature, you measure volume. Here it's constant volume and temperature and you measure pressure. Okay. So we know what happens in experiment number one. Okay, so we know that in experiment number one, um, we have this phase transition between gas and liquid um, at uh, a certain temperature, which depends on pressure. Or you could say at a certain pressure, which depends on temperature. But either way, we say there's a boundary in the temperature pressure uh, phase diagram, right, between liquid and gas. And um, depending on which side of the boundary you are, that determines what, what phase is inside of the material, is inside of the cylinder. Okay. Now, suppose we want to use that information to figure out what will happen in experiment number two, right? So what happens in this experiment when there is a certain volume? Okay. Well, a natural way to try to figure that out is to say, well, this cylinder is just like this cylinder. You know, if we could adjust the pressure to get just the volume that we want. Okay, so if we want a volume of five liters, say I make up something, um, we could say, here in this experiment, I'll try adjusting the pressure until I find some pressure that makes a volume of five liters. Okay, and then th that cylinder will correspond to this one, right? And then I'll say, well, on this cylinder, on this cylinder, what phase was it in? Okay. So suppose we wanted to do that. Okay, so um, one way to visualize that would be with the, the plot that I, I have here, right? So this is the plot of um, isotherms. Okay, so um, each of these colored lines uh, corresponds to uh, a single fixed temperature, okay? And so, uh, for example, this um, purple one corresponds to Kt is 0.24 in the funny units uh, where A and B are both equal to 1. So suppose um, I'm, I'm working at that temperature, 0.24, in these units. And suppose um, I want to know um, what happens at uh, a, a volume of 15, okay? So a volume per particle of 15 in these funny units. Okay. Well, I could figure that out, right? I would look up, where's 15, okay? So I look across there and I look down. And so I could then say, oh, well, the pressure must be uh, 
you know, this, this number, the point oh one two two or something like that, okay? And I would say um, we must have um, the gas phase inside, right? Because we're on the uh, high volume side of the transition. So this is all gas up there, okay? And if I said, hmm, what happens at uh, a volume of 12 in these units? Okay, here's 12. It's right about there. Okay, well, that means that there must be this pressure, right? So it's a, a gas with a higher pressure. Okay, so that's my prediction of what's inside the cylinder with a volume of 12. Let me skip to something else. Suppose the question is, what happens at a volume of 1.5? So then I look over here and I say 1.5. Well, let's say that's a point right about here. Okay, so then I would say, well, that corresponds to the liquid phase. So my cylinder is full of liquid okay, and it is at this pressure right there. Okay. What if I want a volume of uh, 1.49? Well, this, this line in the liquid phase, it's almost horizontal, but it's not exactly horizontal. So, you know, if I look across from 1.49, uh, maybe it intersects way over there. So it's still liquid with some huge pressure inside. Right. If there were a real cylinder, it would probably break. But I, here I have a hypothetical cylinder that can withstand any pressure and it never breaks. Okay, so um, here, I would then say, oh, well, if I want to reduce the volume from 1.5 to 1.49, I have to put a huge pressure on the cylinder. But, okay, the cylinder is automatically adjusting the pressure in order to maintain fixed volume, okay? So the cylinder can put any pressure, okay? So that is to say that the liquid is almost incompressible. Oops, almost incompressible. But some very slight possibility to compress it, okay? So uh, if you want to reduce the volume a little bit, you can achieve that by putting on a huge pressure. I could keep going until I get down to a pressure, excuse me, a volume of one, okay? So if the volume equals one, if the volume equals one, that really means the volume equals B, because I'm working in units where B is one, okay? If the volume B is one, that requires infinite pressure. So I cannot get to a lower volume than that. But anyway, this is kind of, hypothetical, this is not going to happen in a real experiment because your cylinder will break before that. Okay. But now let me get to a real thing. Suppose instead I say I want a volume of five in these units. So I, then I say, well, okay, what pressure gives me a volume of five? Hmm, there isn't one. There's a gap there, right? That um, there are pressures that give bigger volumes 
there are pressures that give smaller volumes, but there's no pressure that gives a volume of five. And you could imagine that, uh, one way to understand it is to think about the, um, the plots of the Gibbs free energy, right? We had plots of the Gibbs free energy as a function of volume. And sometimes it looks like this, right, in the gas phase. And sometimes it looks like that, right, in the liquid phase. Okay. But the volume of five is you know, in there. There's there's no pressure where the minimum is at five, right, at this temperature. It skips over five. But that's a problem because this is a totally feasible experiment, right? Somebody can really do this in the lab. They can put a, a certain number of molecules in the cylinder and uh, a certain volume for the cylinder and adjust the temperature. And so you can get a situation like, like this, where the volume per molecule is, is five. Right? Um, and so the sample has to do something. So the question is, what will it do in that situation? Okay? Um, because there is no equilibrium phase with a volume of five at that temperature. So what it does is it can say, well, there is an equilibrium phase with a volume of 1.5. That's this thing right here. Okay. There is an equilibrium phase with a volume of 12. That's this thing right there. Okay. So that means a, a, a liquid with this volume and a gas with that volume. Okay. So that means that the cylinder could have some liquid of this volume and some gas of that volume inside. Okay. So if you were to look through the window, right, what you would see is uh, say some liquid down here and some gas up there so that the average volume comes out right. Okay. But it won't be uh, that either phase has exactly the right volume, but it'll be some liquid, some gas, and you get a coexistence between those two things to get the right overall average volume or the right overall average density. So that is a big contrast between the constant volume experiment and the constant pressure experiment. Okay. In the constant pressure experiment, it's the same pressure everywhere inside the cylinder. So it's the same phase everywhere inside the cylinder. But in the constant volume experiment, um, it doesn't have to be the same density or the same volume per molecule everywhere inside the cylinder. Right? The cylinder can break up into some liquid region and some gas region. Okay? And then the average will come out right. How much uh, 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 density? Right, or, or volumes per molecule, but individually it'll be different regions. Now, the way I drew this picture has liquid on the bottom 
and gas on the top. Um, that's how it normally works in the Earth's gravity, right? Normally in the Earth's gravity, when you have some liquid and some gas, uh, then, um, then the liquid goes to the bottom because it has a higher density, okay? Um, you might say, what if we do this in outer space, right? So that there is no gravity going down on the liquid. Um, so with no gravity, um, you might get a, a situation like this, where there are um, a bunch of droplets of liquid surrounded by gas. So these would be liquid if, droplets. Uh -huh. Those droplets um, emerge to one large droplet. They, um, they might do that. And that's uh, a question of, um, of dynamics of the, the, the process of whether they will merge or not, right? Um, let me set that question aside for the moment, okay? Um, so, but anyway, there, there will be liquid droplets, right? And then there's gas in between, right? So gas everywhere. Um, or it might be the other way around. It might be that you could have mostly liquid with some regions of gas inside, and then those will be called bubbles. And um, again, Cheng's question still applies, right? Would there be a lot of little bubbles or just a few big bubbles, right? And you know, either of those things might be possible. Or you might get a situation where, say, one of the phases coats the surface, right? And so it might be that there's mostly gas, but then regions of liquid on the surfaces, uh, depending on whether the liquid or the gas has a preferential interaction with the surface. Um, okay, so um, these are some of the possibilities of what you might see through the window if you were doing this experiment um, in outer space, right? Um, okay, but now let me come back to you know, how you interpret things on a plot like this one, okay? So this is a plot of um, isotherms, okay? And so here we would say um, in this plot, if you're looking at a certain temperature, so uh, in this case, uh, 0.24, um, you see a jump from gas uh, at high volume to liquid at a low volume. What if you're at a different temperature, right? So uh, this uh, purple line is Kt is 0.26, right? So a higher temperature. Okay. So here, there is a jump between uh, gas at this volume, about eight, and liquid at this volume, okay? So if you have any volume above eight, it would be pure gas. If you have a volume below 1.5, it'll be pure liquid. If you have a volume in this region, you need a combination of both of those two things to fill up the cylinder. Um, likewise, at an even higher temperature in this yellow plot, right? It's a jump from, from there to there. Now, um, we could also see the same 
thing if we were um, looking on these uh, other plots, the, whoops, what do I have here? Rain versus temperature, okay. If you were looking on these plots, the, the isobars, okay. so each of these plots is at um, some uh, fixed pressure. So now, if I say I'm interested in what happens at um, a certain temperature, now it's even easier because now I can just look up the temperature that I want on the horizontal axis. Okay? So I can say maybe I care about a temperature of uh, 0.255. 0.255, okay. So at this temperature, there's a jump between liquid at this small volume and gas at this uh, big volume, okay. So that means at this temperature, 0.255, right, if I have any volume up here, I would have pure gas. And this is pure gas at various pressures. Okay. So for example, this, let's say the purple line, oh, how did I label it? Uh, the purple line, this is at P equals 0 0.02 in my funny units. And this line is at P equals 0 0.01 in my funny units, okay? And so this line you know, keeps going up the arc, right? So if I'm here, it's pure gas at a pressure of 0 0.02. If I'm up here, it's pure gas at a pressure of 0 0.01. If I'm here, it's pure gas at a pressure of 0 0.015. Okay. So the pressure is going, uh, is varying smoothly uh, along this trajectory. And if I look down there in this narrow range of volume, there is pure liquid. And in between, if I have any volume in this range, then inside the cylinder, I need to have some liquid and some gas. That might be called uh, coexistence. of gas and liquid. So that is what's happening at this specific temperature, okay? At this specific temperature, I get coexistence in this range, okay? What if I do it at a different temperature? Well, at the lower temperature, it's coexistence in that range. Okay? At a higher temperature, it's coexistence in the smaller range. When we get up to the critical temperature right here, corresponding to that critical point, there's no more coexistence, right? That here, at, at uh, this temperature, the I interval of coexistence has shrunk to zero, right? And so um, here, that means that there's um, no range of volume where it's impossible to get a single phase, right? You can have a single phase 
for any volume per particle that you want. So no more need for coexistence. Now, what if we want to map out the whole range of possibilities as we vary temperature and vary the volume? So to do that, I would want to connect up the boundaries. So I'll get another color pen. Okay. So I could connect up the boundaries. I could say the boundary between pure gas and the coexistence is something kind of like that. Okay. And the boundary between pure liquid and coexistence is something like that. Okay. And so then this makes a, a volume temperature phase diagram. Right? It makes a diagram where we can say, if we specify temperature and we specify the volume per particle, if we are anywhere on this side of the boundary, it's pure gas. If we're on this side of the boundary, it's pure liquid. If we're in between, there is coexistence. And if we are out above the super, uh, above the critical point, TC, there is the super critical fluid. And once again, just as I was telling you on Monday, right, there is, there's no real boundary where you say, when do I go from gas to supercritical fluid? It just kind of gradually goes from one to the other, right? Or from liquid to supercritical fluid. There's no boundary there. So you could go from gas to supercritical to liquid, and never cross a phase boundary, right? It would just be gradually changing the temperature and the volume, um, and um, you would make the change from, from there to, to there, right? But if you try to go this way, you're crossing a phase boundary. Now, when people present this plot, they normally flip it so that temperature is on the vertical axis. Okay. Here is a flipped version where temperature is on the vertical axis. Okay. You can see that this line is the same thing as this line, just flipped on its side, okay, so that temperature is on the vertical axis. Okay. So, um, in this plot, here's temperature, here's volume. So um, if you have um, the large volume, you have just gas over there. If you have the small volume, you have just liquid. If you have the high temperature, you go past the critical point. So this point right there is the critical point where the two phases, liquid and gas, come together. And uh, so up here is the uh, supercritical fluid. And in between the gas and the liquid is this region, um, which is, uh, is commonly called uh, two-phase coexistence. 
or sometimes biphasic coexistence. Or people could call it the biphasic region. But with any of these words, right, what it means is if you specify this volume at this temperature, you get uh, some gas and some liquid. Now, people draw it with all these um, horizontal lines, which are uh, often called tie lines. Uh, tie lines. And the point of these lines is to remind you that um, if you are anywhere in this region, uh, you need to look to your left and look to your right to see what phases will be present, right? So it's a combination of a liquid with this volume per particle and a gas with this volume per particle. And then if you were at, um, say, a lower temperature, it would be a combination of a gas, of a liquid with this volume and a gas with this volume over there. Um, you know, the gas can exist with arbitrarily big volume per particle, but in the coexistence, you don't have this super low density gas. You have a combination of gas right at the borderline with liquid right at the borderline. Now, you might want to know if you are in the coexistence region, how much gas do you have and how much liquid do you have? Okay. So let's, um, let's figure that out. Okay. So if you are in the coexistence region, In the coexistence region, um, well, you, you have a coexistence of gas with a volume per particle of little vg and liquid with a volume per particle of little vl. Okay. And now you want to know um, how, how much liquid is inside the cylinder and how much gas is inside the cylinder. Okay. So here's our cylinder. Okay. It has a total a uh, volume of V and a total number of molecules N. Okay. Inside of that cylinder is going to be some gas and some liquid. And now uh, the gas has some volume, let's say capital VG, and a number of molecules, capital NG. And the liquid has a volume, capital VL, and a number of molecules, NL. So what do we know about this, right? Well, we know that there must be a certain ratio between these two things, right? That capital VG over capital NG has to be a certain property of the gas that's specified, right? This, this number, right? This is the number that we could read off from 
the phase diagram over here, right? It's whatever is the, the, the gas volume at that temperature, the minimum gas volume at that temperature. And there must be a certain ratio of the liquid uh, VL to NL. And that is a property of the, the liquid, right? That we would read off from the boundary over there. So um, this um, is, is two equations which relate those variables, VG, NG, VL, NL, right? What else do we know, right? Well, we know that the total volume is divided into the liquid volume and the gas volume, right? So we know that V total is VG plus VL. And we know that the total number of molecules is NG plus NL. So this now is a set of four equations in four unknowns. That is VG, NG, VL, NL. So you can solve this using the methods of high school algebra, right? And you will get solutions for these things, okay? And so um, um, I, I don't really want to take the time to do that in front of you because I'll probably embarrass myself, right? Um, so I'll just uh, quote the answers. Whoops, I don't want that picture. I want... Um, so I'll quote the answers for that, okay? And so, um, you know, there's some answer for the number of molecules in the gas phase. And so that's this uh, VLTN um, divided by VG of T minus VL of T. Uh, I'll say, et cetera and C equations uh, 3.61 in the book, okay? And um, the important result here is to say, um, when you move along a line like this, when you move along like this, when you're close to the liquid point, it's almost all liquid, all right, with just a little bit of gas. When you are close to the gas point, it's almost all gas with just a little bit of liquid. That kind of makes sense, right? And then when you're in between, it's a more complicated thing. There will be some liquid and some gas. Um, the, the set of equations that are written uh, out in 3.61, these things are called the lever rule because it just turns out that the equations are the same as the equations for um, how do you um, balance a lever, right? So if you have a lever that's resting on the ground like this, right? And so uh, here is the, the, the fulcrum, right? And so you have one weight over there and another weight over there, right? But they're dis different distances out from the center, right? Then you need uh, a big weight to sit over here and a little weight so over there and then it'll balance, right? And so that's equivalent to the equations here, right? If you are at a certain 
point there that's say close to the liquid, then you need to have uh, a lot of liquid and just a little gas, and then it'll balance, right? A lot of liquid because it's close, and a little gas because it's far away, and then it'll balance. Um, and so um, rather than trying to uh, embarrass myself with an example right here, um, I put an example on your homework. And so you will have the opportunity to, to work these things out. So please do see the homework that is, um, that is uh, posted on the Blackboard now, which is due a week from today. So what, what I want to do to kind of wrap up this discussion is to give um, an example of um, what would happen if you raise the temperature at different volumes. Okay, so I want to um, come back to this phase diagram right? and consider what happens in two hypothetical experiments. Okay. So one hypothetical experiment will be, um, suppose we start at a point, uh, let's say over here. Okay, so this will be experiment one. Okay, so we start at um, a, a low temperature and we have a sample with fixed volume and it has mostly gas and a little bit of liquid in it. And so this will be um, for uh, experiment one. Okay, we start some sample with fixed volume and it has mostly gas with a little bit of liquid. Okay. And then I'll compare that with experiment two, which is right below the critical point. Okay, so let's say right over here for experiment two. Right. So experiment two, it's right below the critical point. Right. And so this is um, this is a, a sample that's initially at the same temperature and you, um, you have a lot of liquid. And there's some gas also. So these things are both at the temperature of 0.23 in these funny units. Right. And now, um, in both cases, I want to raise the temperature. Right. So I want to go to a higher temperature like that and a higher temperature like that, okay? So I'm gonna keep the same number of molecules in the same volume and just raise the temperature and see what happens to the sample by, by looking in the window. So in experiment number one, as I raise the temperature, follow a path like this, okay? So I'm going to higher temperature and I'm getting closer to the boundary. Not because I'm changing volume, I'm staying at the same volume, but the boundary is getting closer to me, right? And so even though I'm at the same volume, I get closer to the boundary and I intersect the boundary at a temperature of uh, 0.24, okay? So when I get to a temp temperature of 0.24, okay, 
I will see the amount of liquid inside the cylinder gets smaller and smaller. And eventually, when we reach this point, there's no more liquid. It's all gas. So if I look in the window, I will say, it's all gas. Right? And then, as an observer, I will use words like, oh, the liquid has boiled off. Right? All the liquid has transformed into gas. So now it's just a big sample of gas. And if I continue to increase the temperature, it stays all gas, right? And now instead of having a, a, a um, high, uh, instead of a low temperature gas, it's a higher temperature gas, but it's still a gas. Higher temperature is higher pressure. Okay. Now, what if I do experiment two? Experiment two, I raise the temperature, it's still a combination of liquid and gas. I keep going, still a combination of liquid and gas. I keep going, still a combination of liquid and gas. Right? But what I would notice as I get way up here is that the liquid and gas are not so different from each other as they used to be. Right? Way down here, the liquid and gas are hugely different. That the gas has a way higher volume and lower density than the liquid. Right? But when I get up here, not so different anymore. Okay? So at, okay. at the higher temperature, like T equals 0.29, there's still gas and there's still liquid, but the boundary is just kind of fuzzy. Uh, it's hard to tell the difference between liquid and gas. If I keep going up here and I reach the critical point, then there's no more difference at all then the cylinder is all full of something. There's just one phase inside the cylinder, but you wouldn't really know what to call it anymore because the distinction between liquid and gas has just kind of blurred out. So then we would say inside here, it's all um, supercritical fluid. And then if we continue to increase the temperature, it's more supercritical fluid, right? And so um, you, um, you still would have only one kind of phase inside the test volume. So um, in, in both experiments, you go from a two-phase coexistence region down there to a one-phase up there, but the process looks different, right? If you go this way, the process looks like the, the liquid has transformed into gas. If you go this way, the process looks like the distinction between liquid and gas has blurred out, right? So those are two different um, ways that you would look at the, um, the change crossing from coexistence to single phase.